Vince Foley in Benghazi for Global Post. Libyan leader Gaddafi says he's coming to Benghazi with no mercy. Right now in the streets, uh, it's gun volatile, uh, but there's been no direct attacks on Benghazi as of yet. What we see is sort of like an organized protest, and there's also a massive unorganized, sort of spontaneous protest. Some of these were in response to rumors of bombings or strike backs on Gaddafi's. Other ones were in response to uh, some of the planes going overhead today. There does seem to be a strong sense that they won't give up the fight and that there are, are in this city of a million people a force of young fighting men. Although unorganized, there's plenty of will to fight and to hold out here. If Gaddafi comes to Benghazi, what do you think will happen? What's happening? We won't give up. Are you guys prepared to fight? No, but we have a strong faith we won't give up. It's over for him. Nobody in the world accept him. A strong army here in Benghazi to fight Gaddafi? I cannot say. We're strong with Allah. And, and Allah will keep us. These photos are the martyrs of the conflict so far. Every day we see new pictures of uh, rebels that have been killed in the conflict added to the wall. From what I can see, um, there's no real organized uh, defensive posture within the city. Today, we heard reports that rebel forces shot down one of Gaddafi's aircraft. We can't confirm whether it was shot or crashed. We have some doubts if it's Gaddafi's plane. This is Jim Foley reporting from downtown Benghazi, Global Dictionary Square, Global Post. Freelance journalist and war correspondent James Foley arrived in Libya from Afghanistan to cover the Libyan revolution. Three weeks later, he was ambushed by loyalist forces along with two other reporters, one of whom was killed. After over six weeks in captivity, Foley was released and he returned to Libya to report on the final days of the Gaddafi regime. Here he answers questions about his experience. Right, that incident, it wasn't a rebel movement. Um, First of all, I, you know, I feel like we're obliged to release everything to the public, you know? I feel that's our job, you know? The military can't do that. Um, organizations, some organizations can't do that, but I think that's our, that's, that is our job. I and mean, if we don't do that, we're gonna be t treated as more suspect than we already are, right? So this, the CIA story is cool because uh, Human Rights Watch, an organization that's been on the ground in Libya, um, you know, looking into issues of abuse and torture and human rights watch and prisons, they uncovered this trove of information. And uh, uh, Officer Musa Kusa, who ran external security, so he basically ran the Libyan version of the CIA. And these documents were fascinating because they uncovered correspondence um, between, you know, CIA station chief and Musa Kusa, who was the head, the head man, the head, uh, external security chief who had tremendous of power, fled Libya before a couple months before Tripoli fell. So they had correspondence between CIA and Britain's intelligence equivalent, which is what, MI6? Yeah. So these two agencies were actually competing to earn Musa Kusa's favor, as we know in these, in these reports. It's well documented now. Um, okay, what, when this was, this was during the uh, you know, after post 9-11, they were looking for certain individuals, certain Libyans who were seen as Islamists, who were seen as uh, armed Islamists, and who the U.S. Uh, thought had Al-Qaeda connections, and of course the Libyan regime was interested in because they're, uh, they've been known to plan assassination attempts against Gaddafi. But not during the attack, right? That was all prior to that? Right. Right, 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 right. This is a, right, right, right. If it was CIA on the ground, you know, tell me that story, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, we were looking for those CIA guys, but <laughs> couldn't find them. I think they can disguise them pretty well. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, no, that's, that's a good question. I mean, because you can argue that, you know, um, 
And of course, first social media amongst the Libyans sort of fueled the popular revolt, the popular outrage. But then you can argue that certainly the international media sort of fomented this idea of, this, of these atrocities that needed to, you know, the West needed to come in. You know, and I, I don't have any answers. I, I think as journalists, we, were, we, were, we needed to be uh, very careful about our ethics because even me turning a camera on somebody who has a gun can cause them to shoot in the air and literally wound somebody or themselves. So the camera is a, it's an act, I guess it's an active participant. You know, you're an active participant. So, you know, um, you know, I'd say that, um, you know, all, all I can say is what I saw and heard. I was there five days before NATO came in. Um, it looked like it would have been a legitimate massacre with uh, heavy rockets and tanks rolling through a city that had very little defenses. Um, you know, we investigated this Abu Salim massacre, uh, which uh, 1,100 uh, political prisoners were basically killed um, by the Qaddafi regime. Um, but, at, but at the same time, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of speculation that, um, you know, NATO, uh, NATO uh, could see the end game, you know, and, and oil production is up in, up in Libya, you know, the highest level since like 2008. I was reading an article today. So, you know, but these were already deals that the Qaddafi regime had, had, uh, had sort of linked in. Um, you know, I, I had a professor accuse me the other day of being a sort of a NATO tool and that, you know, uh, I was shocked, you know, this is a professor uh, at the University of Arizona, and he said, you know, any, anybody that was on the ground then, we know that they were sharing information with NATO, which is, it's absolutely not true, it's unethical. Uh, maybe there was people posing as journalists, which I, I said is, you know, very dangerous to the profession and probably unethical. Um, but, you know, hey, look, if we have those documents, you know, we as journalists, we want to find out if there is proof of these documents of NATO, um, you know, like actively working on the ground, actively let a plan for post Iraq production, I mean, post Libya production as in Iraq, you know, there's serious evidence of that. Please, let's find it. Please, let's out it. You know, I just don't, I, I don't think we can, uh, we can delve into this anti imperialist rhetoric without really looking at the facts and really thinking about uh, what's happening. Uh, first thing, I, I guess I would just say, can, I, can it be a hyphenated word? <laughs> life changing, life changing, is that, is that a word, life change, hyphenated? Um, and, I, and I think that uh, for going into media, I think that, you know, I was talking with some of uh, the professors here at San Diego State and it's like, you know, international media is important and, uh, you know, we can't, it's very hard to be the next Anderson Cooper these days, you know? It's like, you know, you're, it's kind of like, you know, there's one Anderson Cooper and about 10,000 unpaid freelancers, you know? But um, I think, you know, it's just a passion for telling stories. It's a passion for using media to tell stories. You know, um, there's so many tools we can use. But I think it's about a passion for a place, a passion for different kinds of people communicating. And I think that, you know, to, to do what uh, I do is, is pretty foolish. And that, you know, the kind of sort of the real way to, to understand a society is to live there, you know, learn the language, learn real sources, and sort of like kind of go in up to your ankles, you know. So then you go into your like, your, your, your knee level, you know, and you sort of, and that proves to be the better stories. But the problem is, you know, you can get competitive and you can want to jump ahead. And, and, you know, sometimes you get a good story with that, but sometimes you could just appear to be just like another, you know, Johnny come lately, like jumping into Egypt or, you know, jumping into Libya. And, and so you really have to develop a passion for where you are, I think, or, or your subject area.
Yeah, no, that's a good call. And that's, it's, it's really hard to watch about Syria because um, you feel two things. And, and for me, one is I wish I was there in a strange way. I want to be there in Syria. And you know, I want to be there in, in Homs. You know, and, and, but really, I think that you know, you know, what, what I put people through, what I put my family through, and, and you know, they, they tell me now, don't, please don't go to Syria. Please don't go to Syria. Please, you know, it, you know, you see what you put your family through. And, you know, even some of my brothers who are in the military, I, I worry about them in Afghanistan. And, and um, at a certain point, it's like, okay, you could cover Syria, but, but when is the time to cover it? And what is the best way to cover it? You know, and there's, there's God bless them, there's always going to be freelancers going there and getting something amazing. You know, the BBC can go there because they have the infrastructure to go there, and, and they can do it a little more safer. Um, but, you know, I, I, honestly, there's two sides of me. I want to be in Syria right now, and at the same time, I think that it's wise to, to wait. <laughs> As journalists, you know, I think that we should be as, as stateless as possible, right? We have to try to be, you know, uh, try, try to look at it like try to follow the story and try to follow, you know, where the corruption, where the influence, where the money, where the power is, right? And I know that sounds idealistic, and I know that, you know, was, some of the things in the build up to Iraq were. Um, Really, really, uh, I mean, it was huge deception, right? And for somebody like the New York Times to be supporting this, you know, uh, call for you know WMDs is just, I don't think, something that we can erase. And I and I do think that, um, you know, yeah, there's plenty of there's plenty of journalists right now that will argue to you that the U.S. did the right thing in invading. I'm sorry, invading and in, uh, bombing. You know, Qaddafi forces, and but then quickly, uh, this didn't become a defensive mission to protect civilian. Uh, so only civilians didn't it. It became taking out strategic uh, positions. So then it became an offensive uh, tool, and then also uh, NATO started bombing um, Qaddafi compound. Well, they said it was a command and control place, but don't you think they wanted to take out Qaddafi as well? Um, so, I mean, yeah, it became NATO, NATO became, an, uh, uh, you know, on the side of the rebels. They were, they were trying to take out Qaddafi. Even to the last moment, the last day, Qaddafi's convoy might have escaped was it, were it not for a drone attack and a followed up by a plane attack. So even to the last moment, NATO did win this war, right? My problem, though, is let's please, let's just be factual. Please not, let's not take our ideology and wrap the facts around it. You know, I, I, I would love to see a serious investigation of, you know, uh, how this, this, you know, how, how Libya is going to turn into a, I don't know, an imperialist outpost like Iraq, like that worked so well, right? You know, I mean, I, 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 want, I want this story to be outed. We want this story to be outed, but we're, you know, I'm, qu I'm quite cynical without the facts, you know. I'm quite cynical to be, to hear these rhetoric when people haven't been to Libya recently and say, no, there's no NATO troops on the ground, please, you know. Russian TV is saying this, you know. Syrian TV is saying this. There's, there is no NATO troops on the ground, right? But there, there does appear to be evidence that there was communication between uh, you know, special forces on the ground and uh, planes that bombed hit locations. And there does appear to be evidence that, you know, Qatar sent a lot of special forces. So we need to keep investigating. We need to keep investigating. We need to keep digging. And, and hopefully we learn the lessons from the Judith Millers. And, you know, it, it, but I, 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 I wish that, uh, you know, if, if, if we have news, sites, we have to make sure we consume news intelligently, I think, as well. So.